And hello everyone, greetings from St. Louis, Missouri and the home of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. Welcome to our first web conference since our new ac academic home got moved to the University of Missouri, St. Louis. This is our first day on the job as UMSL employees. So welcome everyone watching our web conference today called From Your Facility to My Home. I'll introduce our speaker to you, Derek Dufresne, in just a moment. My name is Tom Pansella with the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. Special thanks to the Missouri Planning Council for Developmental Disabilities for sponsoring today's program. See, a lot of you already logged in. You're going to have questions or comments to put to, put to us, put to our speaker today. Please use the email questions for speaker link underneath the video window in order to submit those questions. We'll submit, we'll ask them for, for you at the end of the presentation today. Also, if you're interested in CEUs, there's a link for CEUs underneath that window. We've put up a, a couple other links as well. We've linked to Derek's uh, CRA website. We've also linked to the MC MPCDD website for you there as well. There's also a link to Derek's slides, and so you'll be able to see them back and forth in the video window, but you can pop them up as a PDF alongside that window and scroll through them yourself if you like to do that. So now I'd like to introduce Derek Dufresne to you. And Derek is the president of CRA, a training and management consulting firm that he founded in 1982. CRA is dedicated to promoting full community inclusion for people with disabilities. Derek's provided training and consultation to more than 40,000 people in over 48 states since 1982. I could really spend the entire hour just giving you his biography. I don't want to do that because he's a very engaging speaker. So Derek, I'm turning the floor to you. Thanks, Tom, very much. Hi, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to get this opportunity to share some thoughts on, I think, a pretty important topic. But before I start, I want to echo my thanks to the Missouri Planning Council on Developmental Disabilities that took a risk in turning me loose for an hour. Number two, I want to thank my business partner, Mike Mayer, who is very much a part of this and is with me, I know, here today, as well as uh, Dick Caverman from Caverman Fremont that uh, has helped with these uh, p wonderful PowerPoints that you're going to see. As anybody that knows me know, there's two things about this thing today that may cause me to internally hemorrhage. Number one, uh, I don't do PowerPoint. I'm not quite a PowerPoint virgin, but I'm certainly a PowerPoint novice. And number two, I usually move. And you can't see, but my feet are in cement, so therefore I will not be able to do anything other than stand here and uh, try to, uh, to make this look pretty. So I wanted to start with those thanks. I want to start with a quote. Each one belongs somewhere. Each one ought to have to him what is a home, a home in the true Christian sense. It is very certain that if you take the disabled child away from his home and his community, not only will he lose interest, but his friends, his neighborhood will lose interest in him as well. That quote, with minor changes, was written in about 1865 by Samuel Gridley Howe, who was the first director of the first public institution for people with disabilities in this country. Now, the first director of the first public institution in this country saw the dilemma that we're talking about in 2010. It is 2010. And 2010, in our field, the field of disabilities, has some very significant things this year. Number one, it's the 20th anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. But there's a couple of other dates that I find that people have somewhat lost sight of in this. Number one, this is the 35th anniversary of the signing of Public Law 94142 that guaranteed a free and appropriate education for every child with a disability. It is also the 60th anniversary of the opening of the first sheltered workshop in this country for people with disabilities. It's about the 140th anniversary of the opening of the first institution for people with disabilities in this country. What I'm going to say this afternoon I don't know if you're going to agree with or disagree with. I'm going to try to base what I say not only on philosophy but on fact. Not only on emotion but on education. And I realize that there's a possibility of pulling the plug in mixing church and state, but I want to say a quote uh, from the Old Testament that, would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. And if there's anything I'm seeing that's going on in this debate is that we're talking around the issues. And I think we need to get to the core of what this is really all about. And I think that there are some elements of this that we don't have to agree on, but we at least need to acknowledge. It happens to me quite frequently that people say, 
where do you get off on using the word all? Because I do use the word all. And I want you, as you're sitting and listening to this, to think where you stand personally on these questions. Number one, on a scale of one to ten, all children with disabilities deserve, should expect, and we should work diligently every day to be educated side by side with their typical peers. Number two, all adults, regardless of age, severity, chronicity, ethnicity, geography, or income, have the ability to be able to generate income at least equal to minimum wage. That everybody should have the opportunity to spend their days doing something that gives them a reason to get out of bed in the morning. That everybody should have the opportunity not to live in a facility, but to live in a home that I control, that I have the keys to. That the lease is in my name, or the ownership is in my name, or if not in my name, in the names of people that I have chosen, that I have picked, that I love. Now, folks, I come to this from a whole bunch of different things. Let me tell you what I don't come from. Uh, I am not a researcher. I'm not an academician. I, uh, as a matter of fact, I was saying to some people earlier today that as my children often remind me, it took me seven years to get my BA at four different schools with five different majors, and I graduated in the half of the class that made the top half possible. I was not a stellar student. This used to really bug me until I realized that one of the reasons it took me so long to get through school is I helped people because they graded on the curve. So as I was doing very poorly, I've helped stellar students around the country get their PhDs and be able to do the research that I now value. But when you're in school that long and when you've had the experiences that I've had, you get a chance to look at things. And one of the things I find that we tend to look at when we talk about these things, about facilities, community, sheltered workshops, work or whatever, is we talk within the disability bubble and we talk about whether or not people have a right as a client of a program. Well, in addition to some of the other definitions of clients, if you go way back in terms of the definitions to the Greek word, one of the things that it means is people that live outside the walls. And the question is, if you talk to the serfs in the Middle Ages and ask them whether or not they were alienated from the king, what would they say if they never got to see the inside of the castle? We're not talking here, whether you agree or disagree, about people leading extraordinary lives. We're not talking about doing more for people with disabilities than we would do for any citizen. We're not talking about special. One of the things that strikes me every single day is the stuff that I take for granted. Just yesterday, I was in Akron, Ohio, and I took two guys, Thomas and Jerry, out of a nursing home that they each live in, and I took them to Subway. Now, I don't think most people would call Subway a high-end restaurant. I was standing there in line. I'd never been out to eat with them, and Thomas had already eaten at 10.30 that morning. This was 12.30. And standing in line at Subway, they didn't know what to do. They had no clue about the fact that you could choose honey oat or asiago, that you could pick white or wheat. They had no idea that each one of these condiments, the green peppers, the pepperoncinis, the olives, didn't cost more. And I was standing there and realizing they were looking at me like, what should I do? But more importantly, what I realized is that they hardly ever get out. They don't know about community. I want you to think about the language that is used. We take people into the community. Where are they living? The moon? When I go home tonight, I'm not going to say, hi, honey, how are things at the facility? And the reason I'm mentioning this is where I get all, and I was not a student of history, I've already told you this, is from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's the gift of life, there's the gift of liberty, and there's a pursuit, no guarantee of happiness. And so the reason that I'm interested in talking about this with you all 
is that we've got to move this beyond the discussion of the disability bubble and have got to start talking about from whence do these rights come. Because at the core of all of this is not about programming. It isn't about choice. It's about rights. Now, I thank my lucky stars every single day that I live in a country where I'm competent by default and that I am a citizen by my birth. Somebody has to take those two things away from me. And the only way, they, they can't take away the first because I was born in this country. And the second, they have to go to court to take away. We are talking about people that have been diminished. But families didn't do the diminishing. See, this isn't really about anti-family or anti-institutionalization uh, as much as it is anti-citizenship. That if we are willing to allow to use less than the word all, it is an incredibly slippery slope. And it's an incredibly slippery slope because here's what people say to me. Do you really believe that all children with disabilities are going to be educated in a regular classroom and are going to do well? And I say no. Do you really believe that all adults are able, are, are going to make it in terms of owning their own business or getting a job? No, I don't. Do you really believe that everybody's going to be able to make it in the community? No, I don't. And then people say, see, I told you. See, I told you, not everybody's going to make it. And my response, which took me a long time to formulate and feel comfortable with, is I don't think everybody's going to make it. I just don't know who. And when we start segmenting people according to diagnosis, according to history, according to placement, we have taken the place of God. We have taken the place of somebody that I don't at least feel comfortable doing. It doesn't mean everybody's going to make it. We just don't know who. Now, when we talk about this and we get beyond the issue of talking about what is it we do for people, we have to look and see where does the law go when it is at its core. In 1999, the Supreme Court of the United States passed something called the Olmstead Decision. And twice within the last eight weeks, I have been incredibly privileged to be able to sit and to listen to Samuel Begenstoss from the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division. And I've heard it from his own words, something that in my 36 years in the field, I never thought that I would hear. And what I heard him say was that the Department of Justice, for a very long time, has focused on what's called CRIPA, the Civil Rights of Institutional Persons Act, and is focused on making institutional conditions better. We need to be sure people are safe, they're healthy, they get programming, they get after active treatment. By the way, I love the term active treatment. I didn't know there was any other kind. I don't know if I'd want passive treatment, no treatment. I guess I'd prefer active if you gave me a choice. But having said that, I just want to highlight some things that Justice Ruth Gader Ginsburg, Ginsburg said as part of the original Olmstead decision. First, the institutional placement of persons who can handle and benefit from community settings perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that persons so isolated are incapable or unworthy. I want you to think about that word, unworthy of participation in community life. And second, confinement in institutions severely diminishes the everyday life activities of individuals, including family relations, social contacts, work options, economic independence, educational advancement, and cultural enrichment. If we accept this, if we are willing to settle, what we are saying is that people are not citizens, they are clients. They are clients. And I don't want to live in that kind of a country and I don't think people with disabilities deserve an extraordinary life, but they deserve an everyday life. And that's what Justice Ruth Gader Ginsburg was saying, that people deserve an ordinary life. And what I found by spending time with Thomas and Jerry and Andre and Greg, and I could go down the list, is the things that I take for granted every day, they feel like they have to beg for. And so Samuel Begenstoss has highlighted this in terms of some talks he's given about there being several prongs. And the first prong 
is, I believe, fundamental to our understanding the reason we're talking about this. And that is it's no longer good enough, according to the Department of Justice, as their interpretation of Olmstead, for people just to make institutions better. That every state has the constitutional requirement, not the option, the constitutional requirement to do discharge planning for every single person. And there must be a process in place that determines independently, that's a key word, by people that do not have a conflict of interest, whether or not somebody can be placed in a less segregated setting. And then there needs to be education put in place about the benefits of community placement. The second prong is community capacity. That we have to have a place for people to go. Now, let, let's just cut to the chase for a minute about why institutions still exist in this country. It is not the fault of parents that love their children as much today as they did the day that these children were born. I don't know of a single parent that had a child that would say, it is my desire to remove this child from my home and to place them somewhere where I am now going to have to ask permission sometimes to see them, or even if I can go see them anytime, I may have a drive, that it's not their home, it's not the place. No parent would make that decision. There's two things the government never counted on. Number one, the go government never counted on people with disabilities living. So there was never any need for long-term plans. We didn't think we were going to be talking about elders with disabilities. Please pardon me with just a personal anecdote. I come from a family of five. The only thing I ever hated my parents for was that they named all of us with the same letter. And we're all DD. The other thing that happened in my family was that my oldest brother was born with a disability. And the physician that delivered my brother told my parents with absolute certainty, because professionals always know, that these types don't live very long. And when my mother, God rest her soul, see, moms always ask the killer questions. I don't care what anybody says. It's always the moms that ask the killer questions. And evidently, my mother said to this learned physician, and by the way, I know now that this physician graduated in the same half of the class that I did. Because this physician was not prepared for my mother's question because my mother simply asked the killer question. And the killer question is, what if he lives? What if he lives? Well, evidently the good doctor re recovered and said to my parents, you know, these types don't live very long. He probably isn't going to live beyond age seven. But if he lives beyond age seven, he'll always have the mind of a seven-year-old. Well, the learned physician made a huge error. And the mistake that this physician made was when this physician told my parents that these types don't live very long, my brother didn't get the memo. He wasn't in the room. He didn't know he was supposed to die. So I stand here before you as not just a professional in the field, but as a sibling. On March 28, 2010, my oldest brother turned 72, and the physician that delivered him, Dr. Grant, has been deceased for 24 years. My brother, who wasn't supposed to live, has outlived both of his parents and one of his siblings. Now, see, the second thing the government didn't count on was people with disabilities not only living, but parents dying. And when we talk about having people move to the community, these parents that made the decision did so out of love. They did not do it out of lack of concern or insensitivity or wanting to remove this person. They did it because some professional told them the only way to get this service is to yank this person out of your home and to take them and rip them from the fabric of community and have them go and live here. Now, I'm not letting the community off the hook. 
The other reason that institutions exist in addition to families is staff and jobs and unions. And everybody knows about that stuff. It's like the elephant in the room that we don't talk about. And we need to talk about whether we agree or disagree. We have to talk about who are we making this decision about? Because my discussion with families usually is they got their information from staff. They don't live there. They don't know other than what they see in their visits. And they get their information from staff. And the question is, what do staff know? However, the other reason institutions exist is because of those of us in the community that have not abided by the Declaration of Independence, that have used institutions as a backup, that despite our railing against the fact they need to longer exist, still put people in slots, still have people live at places they don't want to live with, people they don't want to live with, that put people in programs, that have people spend meaningless days doing meaningless tasks, and then we wonder when they have behavior problems. I only have to stand still for an hour and not internally hemorrhage. I can't imagine what it's like if you can't figure out why, not, why get up in the morning. And we need to be honest about the community as well. And what we need to say is people need rich lives that include and are expanded beyond those that they have. So there's enough blame to go around. The purpose of this afternoon is not about blame. We have to focus on the fact that in addition to the Declaration of Independence, the federal government is now saying to states, you can't just make your institutions better. And I know from having talked to parents that my parents, if they were alive today, would be 93 and 95. I grew up with the generation of parents that placed their sons and daughters. I get this. I've sat in on conversations. I talk to parents all the time. Whatever we agree or disagree on, it's not going to be about whether or not these parents want their kids to have the best life, that they care about the kids, they love their kids to death. But part of what we've done is we've helped parents kill dreams. We've helped parents diminish. We've helped parents and family members not think about a brighter future because this is what we've said you're capable of. You're only capable of being a client. And people have to beg for things that you and I would never put up with for one of our own loved ones. And we have to change the debate because, you see, the debate is not about choice. And choice is a very slippery slope. And whether or not we agree or disagree, we have to change this whole debate away from the idea of choice. Because it isn't about choice. Because it's not your money. It's not my money. It's public money. And there's all kinds of debates that are going on around this country about what's the purpose of public money. And that's the debate we need to have. What should public policy be about this? And anybody that's lived in a community that's closed, a school, a police, not so much police, but a fire station, knows that public officials have to make public policy decisions, and they have to take into account the community, but they also need to take into account this is public money. And is this public money an investment or is it an expense? And we have spent billions and billions of dollars on places that don't look like where you and I live, don't look where you and I work, and don't look like where you and I choose to spend our time. And that is a fundamental discrimination on the part of people. And that was decided in Brown Board of Education, that separate is never equal. So what we have to do is to change this discussion. I'm through debating choice. Somebody's going to make a choice, and some of those choices people are going to disagree with. And that's why we have lawsuits. That's why people fight. This is why people disagree. But when a decision is made, the fundamental question that has to be answered is, so what? I didn't want this to happen. So what? I wish it hadn't happened. So what? And I only say, so what, not to be insensitive. I say, so what are we going to do? And that's the place that we need to change the power structure. Because the worst thing we do to families, the worst thing we do to people with disabilities, is say, we're going to take you out of this place, and we're going to have you go live in the community. And then when people live in the community, and they live in places they haven't chosen with people they didn't choose to live with, and have days that are gray, and days that they can't figure out why they get out of bed in the morning, it's the second institutionalization. But lest that be a slippery slope, let me be real clear about this. I do not subscribe to the theory that there's good institutions, there's bad institutions, there's good community, there's bad community. And when people ask me why, I'll be real clear. Nobody's talking about downsizing or closing community. 
I haven't heard that discussion. You no, know, we really need to close this community. It's really gotten too big. It's gotten too inclusive. It's really not something we want. There are now, as I'm speaking to you today, there are now 10 states or so in our country and the District of Columbia that no longer have institutions. The first southern state, Tennessee, is likely to close its institution unless Georgia beats them to it. This is an inexorable move. Whether we agree or disagree, it's happening. And we also need to be clear that a very small number of people with disabilities out of the total number have ever, will ever, or will exper experience this thing called institutionalization. For every single person that somebody says there need to be in an institution, we have data that shows that there is a twin, a quadruplet, a quintuplet. People have always lived in the community that look just like people in institutions. And I'll get later to about how we deal with that fundamental issue that parents raise. But one of the barriers that we have to think about overcoming once we get beyond this issue is that the biggest barrier we've got is the issue about whether or not citizenship is for all. And we get talking about money. And we talk as if money is the biggest barrier. I understand that we're in a recession. It's interesting to me that now I hear the debate, we can't get people jobs. You know there's high unemployment rate. And the thing we need to say about that when people look at the community is that for the last 40 years, the unemployment rate's been 90% if you get SSI. People haven't been employed during good times, bad times, or whatever. The issue of not, not being enough money right now to have people placed in the community. There wasn't enough money 40 years ago. But the interesting thing is, we always find money for something, whether it's paving roads, whether it's parks, whether or not it's lobbyist expenses, the war, we always find money. And the issue is not lack of money, it's lack of vision. And so one of the challenges that I'd like to share with us is who gave us permission to dream small? Who gave us permission to say, you know what, we'll get to that at next year's plan. You know what, I hate to say it, but I'm going to be out here in a few years and I really don't want to rock the boat. No one gave us permission to dream small. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce to you a very short video about Molly Thomas and about the Thomas family and how they didn't dream small. So please join with me in watching Good Golly Miss Molly. Molly was placed in the Marshall Hap Center in 1951. I love this on her application form. Um, my mom uh, put that she was affectionate and good-tempered. Um, it also says she's careless in that she was spastic. And I always felt very safe in having her at Marshall in spite of the fact of the trends in the field to do community placement and I also discovered that a lot of the other women that she'd lived with for years in the group home had already been transitioned to state-run group homes um, in the community. And I was just kind of like, oops, I goofed. I should have had her, I should have let them know sooner that to keep her with those ladies because she'd been with them for so long. There's really only one principle that guides the transition process, and that's basically about an individual having their own voice and having taking their own control of their own life. Uh, too many times I think we have people, uh, whether it's in the, the field of developmental disabilities or in any social system, where somebody is a recipient to rules and regulations and basically doesn't have control. Prior to making this decision was to get buy-in and approval from my siblings, which was not easy. Um, they always knew mom and dad did not want her to leave and so I took a, several months in talking to siblings whenever I could, um, sending out emails, and you know while I was quietly looking at options and doing my thing, um, also behind the scenes. Sarah was taking care of her for years, and Mom would send clothes to Sarah. Sarah wrote a letter almost every yeah. 
every month or a couple of times a year. Packing up stuff to take. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. And and I remember uh, mom would mention, yeah, I got a letter from Sarah. Yeah. And and mom and dad would sit down and read the letter about what's going on with Molly and and they would phone her every now and then and get updates. And Sarah was her caretaker for oh, years yeah. and years and years. What twenty years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a real consistency in her life because I don't. She never knew us. Mm -hmm. And she never wanted to leave and go for rides or anything. It was yeah. always would make her car sick and be upsetting. And I thought that her real consistency in her life was Sarah. But what really amazed me was how good the process was. The bridges were built. The bridges that need to be put in place to support a person in the community or anywhere that person is were all of a sudden just appeared, fell into place, whatever um, analogy you want to use. As a family member, I felt so reassured that she was going to be as well taken care of in the community as she was at the HAP Center. But also as a professional, I saw all the things that the, the Department and the Division of Developmental Disabilities have worked so hard to do in action. You're bringing up something that does make Molly's situation rather unique, and that is that she has an advocate yeah. that is not just a personal or a personality presence in the decision making down there at the, uh, the institution, but has the knowledge and experience to say in the language of the institution, this is how we want this done. This is what we want done. Don't give me this stuff about everything will be all right because I know. Mm -hmm. And that is so intimidating to a bureaucrat. Well, Molly's first move actually went very well, except that she had gotten sick in the HAB Center before the move, and she never really recovered from that. Um, she would just get um, recurring illnesses every three to four weeks, like clockwork, and was in the hospital every month um, from July through d January. We were, we we're at my home, which is Marisi Home ISL. Uh, this is where my family and, and I live. And we have the employees coming around the clock for, for Molly and the, the other people that live here that have disabilities. There are three uh, individuals with disabilities that live here. Well, I'm not going to say that Tina's this miracle worker here, uh, although I'm very happy. Um, I think Eleanor, staff, and Marshall were great. They were very happy. You know, the perfect storm that led to her recurrent illnesses every month have also led to the perfect sunny day, rainbows, to where she's healthy, happy, and um, is just amazing, the change. This is a different transition in and of itself because she's got a personality that I'm not sure I've ever seen before. And um, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. She's really a lot like the rest of us more than ever. She is just a um, smart, I like funny, sarcastic um, Thomas. And I can't wait for other brothers and sisters to see this because she's she's hilarious. She's she's funny. It takes a while to get to some know somebody their their character and who they are and what they like and what they dislike. And as far as my philosophy, it's just uh, taking what you know. And, and just building on that, and and you work with every individual with disability. You treat them like you would uh, your, your grandmother, or your mother, or your sister, or, or your daughter, because they are somebody's sister. And I've always said that you treat them like you would want your loved one treated, and you offer the things that you would want your loved one to see. And what's really unique about Molly and some of the individuals that are here from different environments is when something is new, it's like a, a two-year-old for the first time that sees something they've never seen before. They just light up and they get real excited about it. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's neat. <clears throat> that's rewarding for me is to introduce them to things that maybe they haven't seen or have done before that, that I'm able to do, like, like with Maverick. You know, I don't know if she's ever thrown a dog or a ball for a dog to play fetch before. I don't mm -hmm. know if she's had that opportunity. But with the occupational therapist, we're looking at aquatic therapy, you know, swimming and different things. And, and what we'll do is just try different things and, and see what she likes and what she responds to and just build on that.
the communication systems. We're working on different communication systems so that she can let us know when she wants to get up or what she wants to eat and giving her those choices. I think with Molly um, and individuals, you really have to look at their personalities and treat, uh, give them a, a reason to thrive, you know, a reason to um, do things, motivation, reason to motivate them. Um, and I think if they're happy, I told Tish, I said, you know, I want to find out what she likes and she doesn't like. I was ready for her to get healthy so we could get to work <laughs> because I wanted to know what we could, you know, do to build on that. I may leave in a year or a few months to go back to the farm, but yet I don't want Molly to leave this place. And we'll have to Skype. Yes. <laughs> and, um, but I want people to be a part of her life here that know her through me and can become part of her friend. I've got uh, a co-worker whose daughter saw the, the pictures in, via Facebook and just said, what a beautiful person this is. What an amazing thing. This is a family that didn't dream small. But the interesting thing is knowing Tish Thomas and knowing a little bit about the family is that there were doubts even by somebody that worked in the field. And this is why there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know about this. I'm worried. I'm scared. I don't know. I've never met previously the Thomas parents. But it's hard for me to believe seeing that smile of Molly that a family would not have been able to rest their head and say she has a life. And that's what this is really all about is offering just an ordinary life to people. So what are some of the barriers? I'm going to go through this fairly quickly but one of the first things that we need to identify is that there's a lack of object permanence. And in a nutshell, what this means is, I know what I know, but I don't know what I don't know. And so sometimes, I found this in my own family, with talking with my father about my brother. He believed that everybody could get a job except my brother. But he believed everybody could live in the community because my brother always lived in the community. So it depends on from where you sit. And my simple point is we have to be careful about object permanence because just because you or I don't know about it doesn't mean it isn't happening. Second is the null hypothesis theory. I think I took philosophy maybe twice or three times, maybe the same class. But one of the things we learned in philosophy was about the null hypothesis theory. Now I was a member of the debate team and a part of the debate team is that you posit a hypothesis and you prove or disprove that hypothesis. This is what I'm finding as the debate has become. That won't work. He'll die if he goes to the community. He'll never get a job. You can't do that. See, the problem is you can't argue with that because there's no hypothesis. That's going to be important when we get into the steps to just identify you don't know that. And the null hypothesis theory ends up putting us in circles. And one of the ways it puts us in circles is that Pogo was right. We've met the enemy. But it isn't about people with disabilities needing to get ready to live in the community. How many more studies do we need to show that people don't need to be ready? It isn't the idea of train and place. It's place and train. We know that people do not transfer skills from one environment to the other. So the greater your intellectual disability, the greater difficulty you have with cognition, the fewer experiences you have, the more a skill learned over here is not going to transfer over here. This is why people within institutional settings and segregated settings view the person from the inside of that place out rather than the planning being community referenced or rather not the person can make it. It isn't about whether or not people are ready. 
we're the ones that need to get ready to accept that all people with disabilities, all if we believe what we previously said. And when we say all, it really turns planning on its head. And it turns traditional planning on our, its head because the first question I find happens in traditional planning is people spend a lot of time saying, how do we do that? How do we do that? We don't have enough money. We don't have enough staff. We're not able to do that. You can't do that. How is the caboose and not the engine of planning? And we need to call it for what it is. It's not where you start with planning. It's right above why. And right above how is what and when. Because if I can suggest anything to those of you that are the technocrats listening, the people that have to do this, and the people that are running agencies, please, please, please don't put managers in charge of this. Put leaders in charge of this. Leaders, as I heard one time, don't stand taller, they see further. Leaders don't need to know how to do it. They need to say, this is what we're doing. And then you want to have a manager or managers that can carry it out. Very important, but we need to be clear about what we're talking about. So, my business partner, Mike Mayer, and I have drunk from the cup of Jim Collins' Good to Great. And we have both read and reread his stuff, have listened to his tapes, have really tried to take to heart what he says. And one of the things he says is, you have to have a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. How about this in our field? Every person, regardless of level, severity, chronicity, ethnicity, age of onset, or income, community is for all. It's not an option, it's imperative. Now, i got really good news for you. You can be agnostic or atheist about this and still apply. Because it doesn't matter if you believe what I just said. It really doesn't matter. It's taken me a long time to come to this, but it doesn't matter whether or not you believe that or not. The only thing is, are you willing to try? Are you willing to test the hypothesis? And the good news about hypothesis is you don't have to believe it's going to work. So when we start talking about this, the action-based planning steps look like this. The first and most important thing is who. I'll get to who in a second. Then what are we going to do? When are we going to do it? Then how and then why? Most of the time what happens is that that is turned on its head and we start with why are we even talking about this? And then after the why it's how do we do this? And then oh you can't be talking about now this is too quick. And then what did you say again? And then who are you going to have involved in this? And I'm suggesting that that's backward planning in its truest sense. We need to turn it upside down. So let's look at some of these steps real quickly. The first is who? Well, you need to have the right people. When I describe the right people in the urgency gene, I was talking earlier today, the best way I know to describe this is people that yell at microwaves are people you want on your team. People that yell at microwaves. People that believe that post offices should stay open 24 hours. People that believe that we're never moving fast enough. And they become part of saying, this is the seat that I am willing to be in. Collins talks about the issue of seats. I don't have time really to talk about this. He talks about the bus. And for a long time, I remember thinking, are people in the right bus? Are we going to the right place? Is it the right destination? The train's leaving the station. He's changed my thinking forever because what he says is that it isn't just about the right bus, it's about the right seats. And sometimes the reason transition fails for people is the people that were in the previous seats that caused the person not to move, that were part of the issue, end up being in the new seat, still being in charge of it. Now notice, I didn't say we were throwing people off the bus or under the bus. We're just saying some people may need to change seats. And then we have to be in the right business, and that's about focus. This is about focus and saying this is what we're going to do. But the who that you have together is critical. Because think about this. How are you going to know exactly how this is going to pan out in the beginning? I mean, it would be interesting if Columbus, when he left 
you know, Spain would have said, you know, my GPS is in the shop. If Lewis and Clark had said, you know what, I heard that there's a mountain range. We can't really do mountains. I don't like heights. At some point, you have to say, we're headed there. And that is when you get into, after the who, the what. And the what is about being crystal clear about your goal, about having a clear vision, about adopting some principles and values. I'm going to give you some. Everybody will live in a setting of their choice within their financial limitations with somebody they chose to live with. We will separate housing and services. The people that run the services should own the housing. Everybody will have the opportunity to generate income at least equal to minimum wage. No one will ever be in a situation where they will be physically restrained. Those are principles and values. And sometimes it can take a while to debate those. And they need to be debated. But the question is also about will. Now, will is a noun and a verb. It's a noun, the will to do it, and it's the will, we will do this. And once you've adopted these principles, and I can't emphasize this enough because too many teams I've worked with gloss right over this. Once you've adopted those principles, they're non-debatable and non-negotiable. We're not going to debate them anymore. We said this group of people was going to move. Sorry, that decision has been made. The horse is out of the barn. We're done with that. Now the question becomes, once we know the what we're going to do, when do you want to do it? This is urgency with purpose. And this is, you know you've got the right people when it's never fast enough but at the right speed. There's this sense of we're not moving fast enough, but wait a minute, we have to take into account some of the things that we need to be aware of is transition shock. And when people move from one setting to another, we now know, and there's data to prove this, that people experience transition shock that is the same as the death of a loved one, returning from war, divorce, this is very significant about what happens to people. Institution to community, community to community, community institution, it doesn't matter. And we don't talk enough about this. There is transition shock that happens, which is why we need to move at the right speed. But the most important thing is we have to overcome inertia. I didn't do very well in school, but I think the law still applies that says, an object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by outside forces that cause it to be at rest. An object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by outside forces that cause it to be in motion. The hardest thing to overcome when an object is at rest is inertia. And in order to overcome inertia, you've got to have thrust. I'm going to get on a plane later today. I don't want the pilot to get on and say, you know what, I figured out we could save 10% in gas if we kind of cruised for a while rather than took off at 400 miles an hour or whatever. You have to have thrust. And then finally, there's the 80-20 rule. I don't have time to go into this in detail, but too much of the time, what we try to do is to do everything perfectly. And the fact of the matter is that 80% of what we do produces 20% of our results. 20% of what we do produces 80% of our results. The key is to do the right 20% at the right time. And the right 20% is we will never do harm to somebody. We will do no harm. We will make sure people have wraparound. We will make sure that people live in the community. But most importantly, most importantly, our plans will truly be person-centered. Notice I didn't say system-centered. Notice I didn't say sort of person-centered. And notice I said person-centered. Now, the person is both the person being supported, but there's other persons involved. There's the family. There's the direct support staff. There's the agency. There's other people. But the person is the customer. The person is the person that deserves our best, deserves our best every day. And that involves then getting into plans and schedules and resources. And the biggest issue is you can't have somebody leading a team that doesn't understand that you need to have flexible actions and concrete outcomes. Because things are going to change. Somebody's going to get ill. Staff is going to leave. The state's going to cut back the budget. And at some point, you have to say, so what? And the other thing you need to say when people say, why? Why would you do this? Why would you do this? is because all means all. That's the reason. Because if we believe all, we need to say all. And we need to keep saying all because at the point at which we say, well, wait a minute, let's wait. Along with all, I just want to make one quick point here. All kinds of organizations and states and advocates even make the mistake of saying this. Let's start with the easy people. Let's start with people that we know we're going to have quick success. Well, first of all, what happens is, the good news is people move quickly. The bad news is you don't learn what it's going to take to, to support people that have more significant needs. 
if all means all, then start with some all that includes people that people don't believe can make it in the community, and then provide them with the supports they need. Now, along with this all, let me be real clear. I want to come back to this. When we do this, we have to make sure that our plans are not just disability referenced. Too much of the time, when we develop these plans, we develop them within the disability bubble. We develop them along the idea that it's going to be the system that's going to provide everything. We need to go back to the point of citizenship, and the plan needs to say, we start with community. We start with embedding people in the community. And we move backwards into the disability system, rather than starting in the disability system and coming out like a tunnel or a chute out to the community. And the way in which that plays out is this. What if we adopted this as a principle in every state? Every single person that comes out of an institution will be connected to a mentor, a sponsor, a community person who's not paid to be with them and is willing to stand with that person and be their partner in the community. What if every single person had somebody at their meeting, every single person had somebody at their meeting that wasn't paid to be there? Now, hopefully that's the family. But families also need to know. And a mom in St. Louis who is 86 years old sent this to me 10 years ago when I was standing and talking to her at a legislative breakfast. And this woman came up to her and said, Joyce, you look wonderful. She's 86 years old. You look like you could live for a million years. And the response she gave I thought was unbelievable. She said, I better. I got no place for my Johnny. This is what's keeping parents alive. The parents that don't have services, the parents that don't have their sons and daughters placed in institutions or the community, is they can't even think of one person that cares about their kid other than them. This is what we need to build, folks. We need to build circles of support. We truly need to think about the fact every single person, and it's amazing. I'm doing some work right now in Ohio along with Mike. There's a group called Love, Inc. What a great name, Love, Inc. They're in a bunch of different states. Their goal is to connect people to the community. Their goal is to help people build a faith life if they want it, but there's no requirement you have to go to church. And when I talk to these ladies at Love, Inc. that know nothing about people with mental health issues, this was the question. Oh, they sound like some of the people that we support that need a ride. Do they need a ride to church? They need somebody to take them shopping? They've already agreed to come to the planning meetings if the person wants them there. That's what I'm talking about, is embedding people in their community. Having said that, I want you to think about our job. Our job is, believe it or not, not to win people's hearts, but to change their behavior. Too much of the time, we spend time trying to convince people. Well, people that don't believe somebody that can move to the community are not going to be convinced till they see it. And if you're going to have people convince them, the best people I know to convince parents is other parents. Not staff, not people that they think is too young to even talk to. Don't talk to a parent if you've got earbuds in. You have to realize that these parents have made a difficult decision, and now we're coming back to them 20, 30, 56 years later and saying, oh, we're sorry, we're wrong. We have to think about the fact that a decision was made a long time ago with the best of intentions, and now a different decision has been made, and you're not going to convince these families ahead of time. What you may have the opportunity to do is to listen, to hear, to think through stuff with them. And then just to be clear, a decision's been made. What are we going to do about this? Rather than going back and going over and over it again, saying a decision's been made. It's interesting when you talk to families and say, well, what if, what if you had access to a budget? What if your loved one had access to the same money as they did in the institution? What if you could have this person live down the street from you? What if you could have your name on the lease rather than the agency? What if this person that you love could now come to dinner on Sunday nights? And staff. My experience is with staff, their switch is off or on. And if the, st if the staff switch is off, you can talk all you want and the switch isn't on. Here's the really good news. You can turn the switch on without electrocuting them. There's ways to power them up. And I certainly believe that staff are capable of that. 
But whoever is part of this team, this core team, you can only have people part of the core team who switches on. And I find everybody knows what that means. Their switch has to be on. They're willing to try. They may not even know how right now, but they started with the what. Oh, I get it. You're asking whether or not I believe this could happen. I do believe or I don't believe, but if I don't believe, I'm willing to try. It's not what we believe, it's what we do. And so the focus is not on research, it's on do search. We need research, but we need to give the researchers something to look at. So we need to be doing. Not only do we need evidence-based practice, but as Mike and I often say, we need practice-based evidence. We need to be doing stuff. We need not to talk about it, not to have committees, not to have committees that talk about committees that do study stuff. We don't need a lot more grants. We need to do it. Say these people deserve something better. They deserve our best. No one gave us that permission to dream small. And when you think about that, it raises all kinds of issues. And the issues it raises is can we really do this? Well, what I say is we've been doing it for a long time. When people ask me, where did you learn about people living in the community? Where do you get off on saying all? Where did you find out that anybody can make it successfully in the community? What I say is one word, parents. Parents have been doing supported living forever. There are parents that haven't had a vacation in 20 years, in 30 years. There are parents that get up three, four, seven times a night to turn their loved ones, that help with suctioning that don't have any resources at all. And our answer to them cannot be, you're a level three. Our answer to them cannot be to wait. Our answer to them has to be, the answer doesn't lie just with the system. The answer lies in community. And in order to do this, it really is about whether or not we really do believe that all means all. It's a question of whether or not people truly are in the community or of it. Because you, see, you can get people into the community and they're never of it. You can have people move to the community as a client. And what happens when they move to the community as a client, they are now a dispensable commodity. And this is why when people get too difficult, and we have to be able to answer this for parents. My son or daughter was in the community. I hear this all the time. They tried my son or daughter before and they ended up failing. Well, the question is, how did they go out? And interestingly enough, in many cases, when you trace it down, what you find out is they went from a place that they didn't choose to live with, people they didn't choose to live with, to another place in the community that was smaller that they didn't choose, that they didn't choose to live with. And they still don't have meaningful days. They still spend their lives in gray. They still spend their lives being bored out of their minds, not trying to figure out. And the one thing that people with disabilities are very, very good at is getting our attention. They will get our attention, and the question is, do people always have to beg? I don't want to live in a country that says that there's haves and have-nots. I don't want to live in a country that says that some people are citizens and some people are clients. And the great news is, there are examples all over the country, including in the state I'm talking to you right now in Missouri, where people have, and including the video you just saw, that people didn't think could make it, that are making it. And the question is not about whether or not the person is ready for community. It's a question of whether or not we in the community are willing to embrace people, not as clients, but as citizens. And if we do that, we can truly, truly change the system one person at a time. I again want to thank the sponsors of today, the Missouri Planning Council. I want to thank my business partner, Mike Mayer. I want to thank Dick Caverman that made it possible for you not just to see a white screen and a bobbing head because I really believe that we need to engage in the discussion. It doesn't matter whether or not we agree. What we have to do is to be willing to answer the question. And the question I'd like to leave you with is this. My mother-in-law lived with us for five years or so before she died. And she taught me a whole bunch of things. But one of the things she taught me about whether or not you can answer this question, she never said this, but this is how she, I think she lived her life. I used to think that when we died, we were going to be asked this question. What did you make of your life? What did you do that made a difference in your life? And I used to think it was about individual performance. So what did we do? What did we do with our life? After seeing my wonderful mother-in-law, Mama, 
and seeing what she did in terms of her own family of eight children, 17 grandchildren, now 18, I now know that that's the wrong question. And the question I think all of us have to be able to answer every day is not what we made out of our own life, but what do we make out of the lives of others. And that's why we must act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. I want to encourage everyone to use the question for speaker link. If you're going to stick around with us for a few minutes, we'll uh, keep, this, keep this open for a little while. For questions and comments, the question for speaker button is underneath the video window, as I said before. We have had a question come in here. Also, if you're interested in CEUs, that link will stay open for a while. We also are aware that a few of you were having a few technical issues, and so we will be posting this up to a YouTube page on behalf of the Missouri Planning Council for Developmental Disabilities, and so we will send you that link as soon as that becomes available. In the meantime, Derek, someone is asking if you would please describe the strategies to use when guardians or families are not interested in pursuing transition from the HAB Center to the community. How can you move their thinking? Well, first of all, I'm not going to be so naive to think that I can move somebody's thinking. What people believe they believe. It's a set of beliefs that comes about because of our values, our history, our knowledge, what we know. So my experience is personally, I don't really know necessarily how to move people's thinking. What I want to do is to first of all try to explore, do we have any common ground? And the example I will give you is I spent some time four years ago or so talking to some parents at the Jacksonville Developmental Center in Illinois. And these parents were adamantly opposed, adamantly opposed to their loved ones living in the community. And they were not aware that it cost $142,000 a year for the loved one to spend time in that facility. And when we stopped talking about place and started talking about supports, the discussion changed. Because here's what I said to them. If two of you families here had access to the money that the institution did, and if you could sit down around a kitchen table with your family and loved ones and say, what would we do? What services would we buy? What would we put together? It changes the discussion. And so, Tom, my response to you is, I don't think I'm going to change their thinking. And here's what the data shows. 80 to 90 percent of families, when you ask them, if they voluntarily had not chosen to move their loved one to the community. If a decision is made because of court order, policy, whatever, to move, 80 to 90 percent of those families are opposed. And no matter what you say, information doesn't help, time doesn't help, arguing, debating, listening doesn't help. That's what the data says. However, if you follow that family once their loved one is placed in the community, starting at about a year out, usually the first year is fairly rocky, starting out about a year, 80 to 90 percent of those families said they never would go back. They never would go back. And about the same thing is true of people with disabilities, except a larger number of people with disabilities want to move than their families want them to move. That's, so what I say is, we have to talk. And my, my big thing is, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. Even if we disagree, let's at least talk. Let's not yell at each other. Let's talk and see if we've got some common ground. But the bottom line is, at some point, a decision is going to be made. And if it's made, what do we do? Thank you. Any questions in the room here with us? If not, it looks like we're going to bid farewell to you for today. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise, your passion on the topic. It shows through. And uh, folks, I hope you could uh, grasp that, if nothing else, through the presentation today. There's certainly a lot to be had on this topic. So thank you for your time and your attention. As I said, we'll leave the CEU link open. We'll send it to you in a follow-up email, as well as as soon as the YouTube video is prepared, we'll send that to you as, as well. We also did an interview with Derek this morning. We're going to post that up as well, also on the Missouri Planning Council's website and on the YouTube website. And so you'll be able to have access to all of that. Of course, the Good Golly Miss Molly presentation is up there in three different forms. Our next presentation is coming up this Friday. It's a presentation on motivational interviewing, preparing people to change. And so we hope if you're available at 1.30 Friday afternoon, you'll join us for that. On behalf of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health, the Missouri Planning Council for Developmental Disabilities, and Derek, thank you for your time today.